Hi everyone, we're back and I'm going to be uh, joined by Dr. Bauer of IVFMD. So um, my name is Farah Duro and I am a licensed acupuncture physician and reproductive acupuncturist. Um, I see Dr. Bauer back in the chat here, but I don't see IVFMD, so I'm not sure what's going on with the sign-in. Uh, but we'll wait for a second and see if she could sign into the IVFMD account so everybody can join over there. Um, let's see. Just, so Dr. Bauer, you are requesting to join from your, um, from your account. So maybe you can see if you can sign out and then sign back in to the IVFMD account so that um, we'll be able to um, put it all together. And if not, we can go ahead and do that. So just uh, we'll give you a moment to sign in, sign out. Um, in the meantime, thank you guys for joining. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Uh, we actually um, have another Q&A, uh, but it's actually not quite a Q&A. It's going to be um, more of a talk about ways to improve anxiety and depression tomorrow night. Um, so if you know someone who's been struggling, um, we're actually going to be talking to um, a postpartum therapist who works also with fertility, uh, pregnancy, all kinds of um, a spectrum of, of um, relationships as well. Um, and she's going to be joining us tomorrow night on our Instagram, so at 7.30. So you guys are please uh, welcome to join or if you know of somebody that could benefit. Um, so uh, I don't see IVFMD here. I'm gonna see if I can go ahead and try to request it. Whoops, let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna set. Oh, yay, okay, I see it. I think it's working now, so I think, um, that Dr. Bauer should be popping up. There she is, yay. Hello. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hello. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's no, okay, it happens, it just does. And sometimes it's hard to sign in and sign out of accounts so that it just keeps signing you back in. <laughs> it did, so. it did. Every time I, I went in and clicked on, I think I think because I you it alerted me that you were starting a live and so I clicked it and then it reverted me back to my personal yeah. account. So it's anyway, it's sorry about that. that. It's technology, guys. It's okay. Yes. It's wonderful. <laughs> but how are you? I am great. How are you doing? Good. Not good. I'm good. Well, uh, it's already August. This is crazy. I don't know. It seems like this year's flown by, but. Um, we are almost out of the summertime, but we're, we know that a lot of you are curious about ways to help with uh, getting your facility back on track. Um, and also if you are starting a cycle, doing IVF, IUI, natural, or you're just curious about uh, early pregnancy, that sort of thing, then Dr. Bauer is your woman because she's awesome at uh, nutrition as well as fertility, and all those things. So um, if you could just introduce yourself uh, for those of those Absolutely. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jessica Bauer. I am, I think I'm the most recent addition to, uh, to IVFMD in terms of, of physicians, but I've been here, you know, close to close to a year now. It's been wonderful. Um, I work um, out of the Boca office. I work also out of the Jupiter office. And I also even work out of our Melbourne um, uh, Vieira office as well. So um, I'm sort of all over the map, available for, for everyone, and I have a, definitely a strong background in um, nutrition, um, as Dr. Duro mentioned, and um, I'm a really big believer in just making sure that my, pe my patients are educated about the process and just getting good results. So I'm happy to be here, happy to answer any questions that people may have, and yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> That's why I love talking to you because uh, you can kind of um, see things from the different perspectives and I know that um, you have a lot of knowledge to impart. So um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, there's a question that popped up that uh, was one of our first questions that were submitted. And by the way, you guys are welcome to submit your questions too uh, in the comments and we'll go back and forth and answer them because we love doing that. And no question is like too off the wall. I mean, absolutely maybe, not. Yeah, Any and all questions are welcome, for sure. Yes. Okay, so uh, um, one question is about, um, I will be having an embryo transfer next month. Is it okay to take melatonin one month before my embryo transfer? Yeah, I mean, I think using a using a small dose of melatonin, whether you're using it um, for for sleep um, uh, at night, or there actually is some evidence of using melatonin in um, in patients who have um, diminished ovarian reserve, um, I think it is perfectly safe. You should, of course, always 
talk to your physician about any medications and supplements that you're using and making sure that they are comfortable with you continuing it through the um, preparation phase for the embryo transfer. But generally speaking, melatonin is a, a pretty, um, pretty benign um, uh, supplement. You, of course, want to make sure that you're using a high quality supplement. And again, I think your doctor can point you in the right direction of that as well. But yeah. Um, and our next question about, um, along the lines of AMH, uh, someone has su submitted a question who's 40 years old and has a recent AMH of 0.19 and FSH of 16.9. Um, there, but there is a question because it says blood not drawn on day three of cycle. Um, so that's kind of, that's, I mean, we don't know when this was drawn, but I think it does make a difference for sure with the FS, FSH. You're 100% uh, right. Done. Yeah. What about yeah. the AMH, though? Does it matter when you have it done? Generally, no. Um, okay. And, you know, and unfortunately, the, you know, just for, for our listeners, the, the AMH level or anti-malarian hormone is a hormone that's secreted from the cells that surround a follicle, a follicle being what houses the egg within the ovary. And it gives you an idea, do you have a low, normal, or high number of eggs for someone your age? And um, a normal AMH is anywhere between about two and five, so certainly having an AMH of, you know, 0 0.1, um, I think that you said 0 0.19, um, is, is definitely on the low side, but not entirely unexpected for someone who is 40, okay? Um, and so, um, the, and, and having an elevated FSH um, can also be indicative of the fact that the, that the ovaries are not quite functioning in the way that they should um, because the brain is trying to tell the ovaries to function a little bit better um, and produce more estrogen, but they might not necessarily be able to do so. So that's why the, the follicle stimulating hormone is elevated. But it is certainly very important that follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, as well as luteinizing hormone be checked early on in your menstrual cycle, you know, day two, day three, day four, sometimes even day five, that definitely can make a difference. Um, but the fact that the, the AMH is quite low may be an indicator um, of, not maybe, is an indicator of, um, you know, a, a lower ovarian reserve. There are certainly options for, for patients who have those kind of blood levels. But again, I, I think it's a, it's important to make sure that you speak to your doctor about that and make sure that you're doing the blood tests on the right, you know, on the right days. Cause you want, you want, certainly want the most accurate information. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, and you know, um, sometimes the, like we talk about a lot, the labs matter, like the, the, the kind of lab that you're going to might be completely different than, you know, I and mean, maybe it's not accurate, but I mean, I, I guess, uh, I would, I would think at 40, you are going to see a specialist, you know, that would be a good idea to reach Definitely. out to someone um, and, and get, you know, an opinion of what's going on. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are hesitant to do for some reason. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's scary to find out like, okay, what is exactly going on, but it's also comforting. And I Definitely. think that it's, it takes a little bit of the stress away to kind of have someone you know, look at your, look at your blood work, look at your ultrasound and say, okay, there are options here. And um, like, for instance, we got a patient, who's made, she had a polyp that could have been an issue for years, you know, interfering with things. So yeah, uh, if that polyp was removed, she probably, maybe she could have gotten pregnant on her own. We don't know. Hey, um, you never know. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. So, I mean, just, I think it's good to, to definitely see, see someone, uh, especially. Um, I agree. Is sex every three days enough to conceive? I guess it depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it totally depends. Um, generally, sperm survives, um, you know, in the vagina for um, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. Um, mm -hmm. So I think to, to generally be safe, I, I split the difference and I say, um, okay, maybe every other day, you know, especially leading up to leading up to ovulation, I think is a, a pretty safe bet to make sure that you have sort of covered all the bases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a very simple way to ensure that you're doing the right thing is to have a basic fertility evaluation of both the, the female and the male. And, you know, there are some cases when if the sperm count is lower or higher or, you know, that sort of thing that it may be um, more beneficial to either space out the, um, uh, the your, your timed intercourse or 
move it closer. So um, getting a little bit of an evaluation can certainly, you know, shed some light on how to tailor the timing your intercourse to, to each couple. Um, they, you know, in, in my opinion, sometimes more information really, really helps us tailor the, our suggestions and our education for, for each, um, each couple so that you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah, because I mean, technically the sperm can survive up to five days, correct, in the re reproductive tract, if they're healthy sperm, you know, like. If, Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So, yep. Um, so hopefully that time is good. And um, how about uh, another actual um, male fertility question? Uh, does male fertility decline at age 40? So technically, the, the, the magic number when sperm quality and quantity starts to decline is age 45 in men. Okay, certainly things can can change that or make it happen sooner um, when a male particularly has, you know, other medical problems, um, you know, if they have high blood pressure or diabetes or are overweight or obese, um, those things really play a role as well. And they can certainly um, compromise the, the sperm quality earlier than 45, but generally um, the, the equivalent to the, you know, the, the ticking time bomb of a, of a woman that says that at 35 things start to decline the the you know the similar age for for men is um is in fact is 45 so okay i didn't know that yeah oh yeah God. yeah so it it really depends you know it um depends on the health of the man and and uh, it depends on a lot of things there you know there are recommendations and there are sort of cookie cutter um guidelines but it's really important that you and your doctor speak about your specific case Definitely. Um, and I mean, a lot of times you guys think, well, there's just not really a time limit. I mean, you can just keep producing sperm. And then... <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that makes sense. And I, I think that's the same concept. We, we want to maximize things uh, earlier on if possible. But um, Definitely. And we do have a question in the chat here. Um, okay, so there's a patient with a transfer coming up. She's a patient at IVFMD. She it wants to know uh, if and when you recommend the vaccine since her transfer is coming up next month, like uh, September 22nd. Yeah, um, it's, it's really an important, an important question um, that, that I don't think anyone really has a, um, you know, a solid answer to. It's a, it's a, um, a question that you definitely, as I, as I always support, is having a conversation with your doctor about your specific case to understand what is going to be best for you. Um, I can say that from my perspective, the um, and I think we've talked about this before on on it, on this platform that the way that a vaccine works, regardless of the vaccine, and the way that it should work is that it revs up your immune system and it revs up inflammation within your body because that's how it teaches your body to to generate the antibodies to whatever virus is is coming you know that the that the vaccine is meant for um and that's appropriate that's definitely the way that it should work um in my opinion the downside of of trying to do an embryo transfer within a month maybe even two and possibly even three months of a of um of the vaccine is uh you know, could potentially decrease your chances of, of success with a transfer. And that's simply um, because of because the vaccine is doing what it should. And obviously, the vaccines are very important and very important for us getting over this pandemic. But I think the timing of it in relation, especially to an embryo transfer, which is very sensitive to things like your immune system and inflammation, um, is is something really to consider i if your embryo transfer is next month um i would my personal recommendation and again this is not this is not every every physician's recommendation but um i might recommend considering waiting um either postponing your transfer until you can get the vaccine um mm -hmm. and waiting a month two maybe three um, before doing your transfer or doing your transfer and then waiting to get your, your vaccine when you're pregnant. Um, you know, that can, that's another, that's another option for sure. Yeah, there, there is a, a, a lot of questions around this because I wonder too, if you already have a heightened immune response, if you are on immunosuppressants and then you get the vaccine, like how are these things working together? You know, since we have patients that have 
you know, but their immune system works very well uh, in, in some yeah. ways. And so we need to work a little less well with the baby <laughs> the implantation going on. Um, and the whole theory is that, you know, your natural killer cells are great to fend off illness. And these patients hardly ever get sick, which is, which is really nice to have right now. Um, but they also um, have issues sometimes with pregnancy since the body is just targeting that embryo like a foreign invader. Uh, and so, so if you're going to be suppressed, my question, like when you're on immunosuppressants or you're on a prednisone, like um, interlipid kind of combination, um, then you're already decreasing that. And then, you know, getting a vaccine, like how do those interact? We don't know. I don't, I don't think anyone's actually studied that. Um, yeah. In, in, in fertility patients, because our patients are very special and a bit complicated, you know. So <laughs> 100%. I think, they're so special. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think those questions we haven't answered yet. I mean, there's just not enough. Uh, yeah, that is that is lapsed there. But yeah, um, no, I agree, and that's the scary part, and and it's and it's really I'm it's very challenging, and it can be very frustrating for, um, you know, pa any patients going through fertility treatments at this at this time when there are so many unknown questions, you know, um, uh, about COVID, about COVID vaccines, and and all of that kind of stuff because it's new for everyone, and I think, you know, the bottom line is that you that you really just need to do the best to educate yourself um, in speaking with your doctor and health professionals and make the decision that is right for you. Um, and that's, that's the bottom, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we had just another vaccine question since we were talking about it. Um, and I think it was from, uh, no, I passed it here. Um, well, I thought, oh, here it is. No, that's a transfer question. Okay, I lost it. Oh well, I saw some other one. That should I was we? Oh, see. should we wait oh, after? I saw. Should we yeah. wait after retrieval to to be vaccinated? Okay. Yes, that one is the one I saw. I saw. I saw that one. Um, so, again, I think um, getting the getting the vaccine like sort of in the vicinity of doing any sort of fertility treatment. Again, we, we're we're uncertain because because the vaccine is being used on, used under the emergency use authorization is not FDA approved. We don't necessarily have the data. We have more data every day as as pregnant women and women go, women going through fertility treatments, um, uh, you know, start to get the vaccine and and all of that kind of stuff. So we have more data as daily as the as the day goes by. Um, but it's sort of my it's sort of my opinion that. If you can, if you can wait until you're out of the, you know, one one to three month window um, from getting the vaccine to doing any sort of fertility treatment, that there may be some benefit. Again, I don't. It, we can't be certain about this. Um, it's it's sort of just my again my personal my personal opinion. Do I think that you're going to cause harm by getting a vaccine? Um, before you do an egg retrieval, the question is the time frame of that. If you if you get a vaccine, you know, while you're in the midst of your of your IVF stimulation, I can't guarantee that there won't be effect an effect on that. But there very well could have no effect. Um, I just think the when you're dealing with scenarios where there are so many unknown scenarios, I think it is. Um, it is best to err on the side of being conservative and being cautious because women are investing so women and couples and um, everyone are investing resources in fertility treatments that um, it's very important. And I wouldn't want to, you know, um, uh, do anything to, to decrease the chance of success of those treatments. But again, every patient is different and every patient needs to talk to their doctor about what is the, what is the right choice for them because yeah. there is no right answer. Uh, and we had, um, I think, a nurse who was working with high-risk patients in a hospital and was asking about the vaccine. It's like, you're definitely high-risk. You know, I mean, it's, you 100%. know, the question is like, do, do you change that position at that point and say, I'm just going to work from home and wait? Yeah. Or, or if you're not, then you're in your face with, you know, a high-risk sort of, you know, job like that. I, I think that that's another thing to consider, you know, your environment, right? <laughs> Uh, Absolutely. Too, yeah. If you're if you're an ICU nurse in the COVID mm -hmm. unit, yeah. get your vaccine. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You know, if your exposure is daily and significant, you have to protect yourself first and foremost, for sure. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. 
And um, okay, and I think, yeah, and the other vaccine question, we, it was similar, like about, you know, the timing, um, because there are some patients who have transfers coming up uh, with, you know, next month and, and in September. So yeah, I guess ultimately, like you said, talk to your doctor, maybe you can, or, you know, put postpone. I mean, if it's frozen, it can be postponed, right? It's not, you know. Of course the end of the world to, to do that. Yeah. Awesome. And I think it's also important to, to sort of educate our, our listeners that it is, it, it is very well appreciated that those, those folks that are pregnant do not fare as well when they get COVID compared to people that are not pregnant. And that's generally the case for just about everything. Flu as well. yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah, no, for the flu as well. You don't, we know that you can become far more ill and have, potentially far more consequences um, in in pregnancy when you when you get COVID or flu or anything like that. So there is definitely benefit to being vaccinated prior to getting pregnant. Um, I just think the time frame in which that happens is still up for debate. And if you can, you know, delay again anywhere between one and three months um, from the second vaccination depending on which vaccine you get um, and doing any and becoming pregnant I think there may be some value in that for the reasons that we discussed um, you know but again it has to just sort of be an individual an individual discussion yes definitely yeah, well sure. um, so we'll get to uh, some of the other questions also here um, do you have that were submitted earlier about um, I guess this is an IUI question. Um, do you have to have both an SIS and an HSG if you're going to do an IUI? So um, an HSG um, or hysterosalpingogram um, for people, people that don't know, that's a process by which we put some fluid inside of the uterus and take x-ray pictures at the same time to watch the fluid go through the, the uterus and the fallopian tubes to make sure that they are, in, in particular, that the fallopian tubes are open and normal. And that certainly is a very critical um, step to take prior to considering doing IUIs uh, or intrauterine insemination because um, you really need, in, in the best case scenario, you need two beautiful, open, normal fallopian tubes in order to do IUI. Um, what I prefer, what I have my patients do is that I also have them do a saline infusion sonogram. So a saline infusion sonogram is a similar principle to the HSG, whereby you put fluid inside of the uterus and use the, the vaginal ultrasound probe um, to look inside of the uterus to make sure that there's nothing there that shouldn't be there, something like a polyp or a fibroid or scar tissue. Um, a saline infusion sonogram is far more sensitive for the, for the uterus itself compared to an HSG. With an HSG, you can very easily miss smaller or um, smaller polyps um, or smaller fibroids within the uterus um, because you're focusing on the, um, on the fallopian tubes and it's very easy to, once you put in enough contrast or dye as we call it, um, you can sort of overcome any sort of filling defects in the uterus and something may be missed. Um, and so I believe that both are important in, in when you're trying to be comprehensive in evaluating both the fallopian tubes with an HSG and the saline infusion sonogram with, um, for, for the uterus itself. So I, I personally think that both are important for every, every fertility patient generally. It's good, yeah, just to map the terrain, you know, you never know. Yeah, and I, um, I see a little question, will the saline infusion detect fibroids? 100%, 100%. Mm -hmm. you're, you're looking, you care about fibroids that are um, very close to or maybe even um, coming into the uterine cavity because those can prevent embryo implantation um, in and of itself. And so um, it's very important uh, to definitely identify that um, from the get-go. Um, and I see another AMH question. Um, the AMH is 1.65, I think, on birth control, IUD birth control with modern fertility. I'm also 30. Is this bad? I'm trying to get pregnant. Should I retest? Because, I mean, there is so much question about AMH, but I don't think that that's the whole picture. It really isn't. Like, there are some drawbacks, I think, to some of the home testing uh, because, it's like it's like you're looking inside a house through only two windows. You know? Exactly. Like, there are 
there are other windows there, but we can't see them. So, um, and, and that's why an ultrasound is important, like, because you could have tons of follicles and then maybe your AMH is just naturally low, like people at O positive uh, blood types are lower, you right. know, and that's, an, you know, so th and there's different scenarios there, but just going off that one number, I've never really believed that that is the way to go. Um, I just Definitely not. And, you know, as much as, as much as we, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist and I believe in science and everything, there is so much to, especially reproductive medicine that is still an art, you know, and you, mm -hmm. and you have to take into account lots of different things, the AMH, the antral follicle count, um, your, your hormones on cycle day three, all of those play a big role in, in understanding your ovarian, the, the, in understanding ovarian reserve as a whole and lots of things go into it. Um, those individuals that are overweight or obese, the AMH can be falsely lowered, um, you know, in those conditions. And, and furthermore, um, it, depending on what kind of IUD you have in place, there are some IUDs that have hormones in them that may be playing that may be playing a role in um, in what that AMH looks like. Um, and so, again, each there's it's it's tough to make sort of generalizations about mm -hmm. every patient, but I think. Um, AMH is not the be all end all, <laughs> as Dr. Duro said. It's you're you're much more than your AMH, and um, it's mm -hmm. up to your doctor to to understand your complete picture so that they can educate you and advise you as the the best way to move forward. So, I would say that you need more than an AMH to to determine um, uh, to to determine your chance of pregnancy for sure. For yes. sure. Yeah. And we're not saying it's not accurate because, um, I mean, I've heard of these, someone was telling me these pop-up trucks that come, uh, I think it was in New York city that were testing oh, wow. AMH <laughs> while they were at work. And I'm sure there are a lot of freaked out people. Like if they looked at this number and they're like, Oh my gosh, I've got to get pregnant like tomorrow. You know, it's like, right. it's not quite like that. I don't think, um, no, because yeah. it can range. And, and two, like, I mean, like you said, I, there's a question about, is it possible to still have a good antral follicle count with low AMH? You see Absolutely. that. I mean, definitely. And we saw, we've seen patients get pregnant naturally with low AMH, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, it's just, and higher FSH, you know, than, than normal. I think it's just that those are, those are numbers and that's data and that's okay. But again, I mean, you'll never know unless, and you also with egg quality, you can't like cut all your <laughs> follicles open, analyze everything. I mean, there's just no right. way to tell. Uh, so I don't think it's, I mean, I know that you do have to, it's important to use for fertility treatment and it's a really good number to use to, you know, gauge your treatment plan and all of those mm -hmm. things. But there's other things that you said that go into it. And um, absolutely. So 100%. I would encourage you guys, if you are um, seeing your AMH number, and it's not where you want to be, it's not like a grade on a paper, where you didn't make an A. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, because, because definitely, we see a huge diversity of AMHs and you guys too, and uh, all the time. 100%. And it's it's much more than that. If you if you have a concern, the best thing that you can do is meet with meet with a specialist like myself or any of the other doctors at IVFMD and ask those questions. We're not gonna we're not gonna force anything down your throat in terms of treatments or anything like that. Our job is simply to educate and make sure that you feel like you're making the right decision for you based on where where we think you are from an ovarian reserve perspective and um that's you know i i'm a i'm a big believer in in getting more information and and educating yourself i know for some people that can totally be scary and um people are afraid of what those results might hold and i totally i totally get that but um you know i think it's important empower empower yourself with with knowing what your options are, regardless of, of what they are. And, you know, you can make the right decision for you. So you're much more than your AMH, please. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. We need like t-shirts. I, mean, <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I always think of this, this patient who has a very low AMH and she was depressed about this for about a year, uh, one yeah. of her patients. And then she ended up going to another clinic and the AMH doubled from what it was before. And it was like two different labs, right? So she yep. ended up getting pregnant with IUI in the first try. Beautiful. But pretty much the whole time she's thinking, I'm, I have to do IVF, this is horrible. Um, and she's saving up her money for IVF and then she gets it drawn again a year later 
we would think it would be worse. And it, it was much better. And she had plenty of follicles too. Uh, so it's kind of like, I don't know, it, at that, that point, you, you just don't don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was bad. All right. So. <laughs> um, okay, we have a fibroid question in the chat here. Um, do you, if you have a fibroid in the uterine cavity, should you proceed with embryo transfer? No. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, All right. That's a very okay, clear answer. So okay. So, um, so certainly, um, you have you have invested your time, your energy, your resources in generating beautiful embryos, and it is a blessing that you that you have an embryo to transfer. And congratulations to you on that. Um, the entire purpose of going through the process of looking inside of the uterus prior to doing an embryo transfer is that is for me. I don't want to put an embryo back into a uterus that is not perfect, okay? And if you have a fibroid that is encroaching in on the cavity or, or in fact has a portion of it, of it inside of the uterine cavity, it takes up physical space within the cavity and that's a physical space where that embryo could potentially implant. And so if you have a uterine fibroid inside of the cavity, I would absolutely recommend that it be removed prior to embryo transfer to try to improve your chances, for sure. There you go. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and as far as the recovery time, would that be usually like how long would someone have to wait? So it depends. If it, it depends on the kind of surgery that you might need in order to remove the fibroid. If the fibroid is largely within the uterine cavity, um, and can be removed from with a vaginal approach through a procedure that we call a hysteroscopic myomectomy, which is a removal of a fibroid with a vaginal approach um, so that there's no scars on the abdomen or, or scars on the uterus per se. Um, that generally, depending on how much surgery you do, you can wait about one menstrual cycle and then prepare yourself for the embryo okay. transfer. I don't see a problem with that. Where you run into requiring a little bit more time between surgery and embryo transfer is if you're doing more extensive surgery. So if you're doing more extensive surgery, like requiring a myomectomy, which is a, rem a removal of fibroids, potentially abdominally, okay, so using a large incision on the abdomen. Like robotic surgery or that sort of thing? Or exactly. Like robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, um, abdominal myomectomy, those generally involve more extensive surgery whereby you're having to make more extensive cuts within the uterus itself in order to extract the fibroids because of where they're located. And when we're talking about the uterus, we want it to, if the uterus is just muscle, it's muscle tissue that needs to be able to heal properly and ultimately be able to potentially contract so that it can expel the baby. And if there, if you have compromised the integrity of the muscle tissue of the uterus, you really need to be mindful of when you're getting pregnant in relation to when that surgery has been done. Okay. Um, because you can increase your risk if the, if the uterus itself, the uterine muscle is weakened because it hasn't had enough time to heal it's at increased risk for what we call uterine rupture when you when you become pregnant, which is sort of separation of the muscle tissue that can be um, extremely dangerous for both you and the baby. And so it really depends on the kind of surgery that you require in order to have your fibroids removed is the, the long and short of it. Okay, and very good. And, and actually we skipped an AMH question. Um, uh, so it was actually um, a little like higher up on the chat while we were talking about AMH. I knew there was another one and I couldn't find it. So I just found it here. Oh, good. Um, what uh, does doing AMH during a norethendron cycle cause it to be, uh -huh, mm -hmm. lower than it originally was? And does estrogen and progesterone alter when on north norethendron? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. So, so yeah. And so norethendron um, is a... Um, uh, is there, I think it's a birth control pill, if I if I remember correctly, and or some form of um, of progesterone. And so, there is some thought that 
if you are someone that has been on hormonal birth control of some of some kind for a very prolonged period of time um, that suppresses the ovaries, which is the job that it should do, that's how it works. There is some evidence to suggest that that may be reflected in your AMH, that it might be a little bit lower than what you might expect. Okay, there are some people that it has no effect on for sure. But there are some people that it does. And unfortunately, I can't tell by looking at you which person you're going to be, <laughs> which okay. is the tough part. But um, if you are someone that is taking a birth control, and your your AMH is tested, and it is lower than expected, one um, one uh, chance, one um, uh, choice that you can make is potentially to come off of that birth control for a couple of months and recheck the AMH to see if there's any change. Okay, okay. there's there's unfortunately no guarantee that it might change, but um, it may be worth doing it if it's an unexpectedly low result. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So many things to consider here. So, so many things. And and so many people have been on birth control for so many years. So I just True. wonder. Myself you know. included. Myself mm -hmm. included. I hear you. <laughs> I love it. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the thing. Um, I don't think women are told that that might happen. So if they're getting off birth control and taking, checking, taking one of these tests, over the counter and they freak out with the AMH is, is very low. It's like, what have I done now? The birth control has really screwed up my ovaries and that sort of thing. Like, uh, then that's, it's good. It's good to know that it, it can come back to and fluctuate. So it can, sometimes it doesn't, but there's definitely a chance that it can. And you know, yeah. that's again, something to, to talk about with your doctor, if that's the, maybe the right choice, if you have the luxury of time to be able to, to come off with the birth control and retest. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and we are still getting through some of the art questions here about, um, I did have one also submitted just before we got started and I, I just sent it to myself. Okay. Uh, if, um, the question was about if medic, if a medication protocol during stims can improve outcome as far as embryo quality is concerned. Like, That's a tough one. Um, I have definitely, I, I have definitely seen that for some individuals, certain protocols work better than others. Um, you know, however, when we're talking about embryo quality, your the embryo quality that you are inherently going to have is probably the quality that you're going to have. And no, no change in how I obtain those embryos is, could potentially improve or make it worse. Um, that being said, the entirety of the IVF process is a numbers game, right? So there's, there's only, not every follicle has an egg in it. Not every egg that you retrieve will be mature. Not every mature egg will fertilize. Not every fertilized embryo will make it to the point where it can be, um, biopsied or, or even transferred. And so if a certain protocol potentially can increase the number of eggs that you are able to retrieve, then from a numbers perspective, it may improve your chances of getting that one beautiful embryo that you need. Um, so if a particular um, protocol has not, didn't work as expected, um, you should definitely speak with your doctor about potentially trying something different because there are different protocols and some protoc protocols are known to be more effective in certain patient populations um, that, you know, some individuals that have much lower ovarian reserve can, can potentially do better with potentially like a micro, a microdose Lupron or a, a flare protocol compared to just a straight antagonist protocol. Um, like I said, sort of what I, what I came back to last time is that there's nuance and there's art to, to this field that, um, you know, that can make a difference for sure. So I would absolutely, to the person asking that question, I would encourage you to have a conversation with your doctor about potentially how you could improve things. And if they think that changing the protocol might and help, might help improve your outcome because it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's another reason to about, uh, to get a second opinion also, right. And absolutely. Set of eyes. And, um, I know that you guys also offer those still virtually and, um, we do free second opinions all, yeah. all day. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's nice because you can actually, if you have a copy of your records, I think it's always good to have your own records. Um, so I, I mean, it's harder to get it. Sometimes you just have to really request those, but those are yours. Like you can, you can take them and you can keep them with you and you can also, you know, use it to kind of see how things improve or things change throughout time when you're doing um, a cycle anywhere else. And so, um, so it's important wherever you guys go to actually just have those. I, I think that's a good uh, thing to, to get. Um, and there is a question here about, um, you know, so, someone who is 43, um, who's done one IUI, two IVFs. Uh, the last one was in March and they want to maximize their egg quality. So they're asking what um, could they do to maximize egg quality? Um, so generally speaking, what, I, what I like to help educate my patients about is that a healthy you, um, provides the, the healthiest form of, of eggs that you can have with the understanding that of course, unfortunately the limitation of age, which you have no control over, um, uh, can, you know, sometimes, um, supersede the, the good work that you do being a healthy individual, meaning that we know that egg quality and quantity starts to decline, um, especially after the age of, of after your 43rd birthday, for sure. Um, so I would certainly encourage you to make sure that you're a healthy weight, um, that you are, that your thyroid level is appropriate. Um, there are, there are certain like certain um, supplements and cocktails that can, that can help assist with um, with preserving the egg quality and quantity that you have. There's unfortunately no magic pill to increase um, your egg quality and quantity. I wish there was. That would be great. I would give it to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. But certain enzymes like coenzyme Q10 um, can certainly be uh, beneficial to to helping preserve the egg quality that you have. Um, and the, again, this again, I, I know I'm a, I'm a broken record here, but you should absolutely have a conversation with your doctor about what you can be doing to improve things, um, because there are different supplements and whatnot that might be right for you that might not be right for someone else, but um, that can certainly help. So, but coenzyme Q10 is pretty well appreciated to be a good a good mechanism to try to help improve the eggs that you do have remaining uh, as a 43 year old. So I'd recommend that for sure. Definitely. I mean, we stress um, you know, eating well and helping with managing your stress, helping with circulation. Um, we, you know, hope that we can also work with both partners sometimes with acupuncture, because if you're 43, your partner might be around that time, you know, sort of age. And yep. uh, you said, like you mentioned 45, well, we got to, you know, start like working on things a little bit beforehand if possible. But if not, um, then at least give yourself three months, six months, hopefully uh, to get things you know, optimize as much as you can. And then, you know, uh, sometimes it takes that long to wait to, to get, you know, your cycle going or to do an IVF yeah. cycle. It takes yeah. a few months, you know, so in the meantime, you can really maximize that time and do, you know, the most you can. Um, Absolutely. And, and, uh, and at really the first visit, I always encourage my patients to get started with their acupuncture because you're going to get the, the most benefit from, um, a longer amount of time that you're that you're doing it for sure. It's not something that happens overnight. Nothing happens overnight these days, yes, <laughs> Maybe except yeah. Amazon Prime. But yeah. um, <laughs> and sometimes but, that's uh, not even overnight. That's I amazing. know. I feel like I'm really <laughs> slacking these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we also have one question um, that we want to want to get to it before our time runs out um, about a uh, block tube. So someone submitted this earlier about uh, how quickly can a tube become blocked if the HSG shows blocked tubes, but one unblocks, can it reblock in a couple of months? Uh, the first IUI ended in a biochemical pregnancy. The second IUI was unsuccessful, done four months apart. Um, the, she has low AMH, it's, which is 0.94 at 33 years old. Um, they're on Lovenox for IUI or was on Lovenox for IUI. Is it worth doing another HSG and trying IUI again if tube isn't blocked or are my chances too low? I'll be wasting my money. Also a tough question. Um, I think the, the thing that sticks out to me the most, and you, sorry, you said she was 33? 33, yeah. Mm -hmm. And AMH of 0 0.94. Mm -hmm. 
So that's truthfully, that's the thing that sticks out to me the most. Um, in at the age of 33, I would definitely expect an individual to have a normal AMH, probably close to two and a half or three. And so uh, this AMH of less than one is is really indicative, unfortunately, of what we call diminished ovarian reserve. And largely, I think that may be the largest contributing factor to um, to your to um, to unfortunately your your lack of success with the, with the IUIs um, because we can't control the quality of the egg that you are that you are ovulating and releasing um, every month when you're doing IUIs because everything stays inside of you. Um, because that's the nature of IUIs. Um, and then the other thing that's important to understand is that unfortunately, IUIs inherently are not super successful. They're for a given individual, maybe 15, 1-5% chance per cycle that an IUI is going to work. And if you throw diminished ovarian reserve into the, into the mix and any other sort of problems, that number goes down. And so you're maybe looking at 10% per cycle or even five percent per cycle um and i think it might be worth a conversation with your doctor um if an iui or two has not worked to maybe consider moving on to to something else um because iui's unfortunately are inherently not super successful um you know they 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 work when they work but they they don't work when they don't work <laughs> which is the which is the frustrating part of it and so speaking with your doctor about what your what your chances are and the risks and benefits of continuing with IUI to, you know versus moving on to something else is a good conversation to have for sure yeah the blocking of the tubes um, if something unblocks and can it reblock that was one question uh, if one tube is is um, I guess I, I mean I guess it would depend on the type of blockage that you have it depends on the type of blockage if you have someone that has open tubes on one HSG and then sometime later they have a blocked tube unless you uh, very because it's very important to understand that sometimes when you do an HSG the fallopian tube can spasm shut okay because it, it does have muscle tissue in it and anytime you go and manipulate the uterus and the, and the and the fallopian tubes it can it can spasm shut with and and read as though the fallopian tube is blocked when in fact it has just spasm shut and it may in fact be normal and open. Um, if you feel as though it will give you peace of mind to repeat the HSG, there's really no harm in it. Um, but I think the, as I, based on the information that you gave me, the thing that stuck out to me the most was the, was the ovarian reserve. I mean, a fallopian tube can, can block, you know, whenever it wants. Um, there are certain conditions that predispose individuals to having blocked tubes, things like endometriosis or individuals that have had sexually transmitted infections in the past or any surgeries in the abdomen before that can generate scar tissue. Those sorts of things predispose you to having blocked tubes. So if you've had any of those scenarios, you know, in between the HSGs that you did, that can certainly contribute to, um, to a problem. So um, there's very little risk to repeating an HSG, so if it will give you peace of mind, I definitely recommend doing it. But I also think we can't we can't um, overlook the fact that I think the ovarian reserve is playing a large role as well. And um, so it's good to see, you know because questions are like difficult sometimes to answer unless you're seeing the patient. Too. Yeah, for sure. We're giving I want you guys to, the I best we like can. Yeah. follow-up questions, but that's not practical. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's like more to that puzzle, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. So, for sure. And as far as, uh, we do have someone who was asking about um, when they can resume massages. They're three months pregnant, so congrats. And, um, Yay! you know, uh, we definitely do prenatal massage at our office. Um, and usually, we actually have gynecologists we work with that refer their patients to us for acupuncture and massage when they're pregnant for lower back pain quite a bit. Um, so that is something safe. Uh, as long as your doctor says it's fine, you can definitely do it. And you wanna go to somewhere that's uh, prenatal certified. So the massage mm -hmm. therapist is certified in prenatal and works with pregnant patients on a regular basis. I definitely think that's important um, because you don't want you know, to, you know, you're not gonna really stimulate anything probably that would cause any issues. But um, like, I, I really think 
that massage is very beneficial during pregnancy and uh, especially um, if you have back pain or you're stressed or you just, you know, like want something to keep you comfortable. Um, we definitely think that uh, that is fine. Um, do you have any? I'm coming over tomorrow because I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And our massage therapist is on vacation this week. And everyone's like, oh. when's she coming back? When's she coming? I was like, I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, there are very few things you can really do when you're pregnant sometimes. Uh, uh, like, you don't even really want to take a lot of time at all and all those things uh, if you can avoid it. So, um, but definitely do acupuncture and massage as are safe um typically so the question is as long as you're not high risk and your doctor says it's okay that you could definitely do massage um go for it well. um and it's i mean we, we usually tell patients once they are transferred to their um gynecologist like when they're done with their ivf treatment and they're you know dismissed they're graduated from you guys uh like nine ten weeks then yep. we can also work with them with massage too um, as far as uh, a question, because like we're running low on time, so there's like I think two or three more questions here. Um, that there's a patient who says uh, she's unfortunately she's had uh, two failed transfers, two tested and two untested high grade embryos. Um, and what else should she be checking for? So you mentioned uterine scratch. Um, so failed embryo transfers are super tough. Um, no matter if they're tested, untested, no matter, no matter who you are, having a failed embryo transfer is super hard. So I'm sorry that, first of all, that, you're, that you have gone through what you have gone through. Um, there are definitely some very basic things that, that need to be done. Um, you know, I don't know when the last time your saline infusion sonogram was done to make sure that there's, excuse me, nothing impeding the implantation. Um, checking your thyroid level, your prolactin level, your vitamin D, um, excuse me, excuse me, all of those things um, are really super important and should definitely be checked ahead of time. Um, there are certain tests that I do prior to embryo transfer, things like um, antiphospholipid antibody, um, checking the, the gamut of, of antibodies that some women can have that may predispose to either um, failed embryo transfer or um, uh, basically predisposed to failed embryo transfer or miscarriage um, that sometimes can be remedied with either baby aspirin or even an, an injectable anticoagulant medication called Lovenox. Sometimes we, we use that for patients that have had failed embryo transfers. And then also your natural killer cell um, uh, activation is super important to check. Um, those women, natural killer cells are a normal part of your immune system. And for some women, they are um, overactive and they can, um, you know, predispose you to either not getting pregnant or to having a miscarriage. And so checking that and, and potentially mitigating that problem with what we call an intralipid infusion um, and, and or using the, also things like acupuncture and, and other remedies to, um, uh, help decrease the the amount of um, how revved up your immune system is can certainly contribute to success. Um, you know, just generally making sure that you're healthy. Um, those kind of things that I that I was talking about. Um, the the thickness of your of your endometrial lining prior to transfer. If you're someone that has a has a problem with um, has a problem with the lining of your uterus. There are certain steps that can be taken to try to thicken the lining of the uterus if that is a problem. It, there's just so many factors that can that can contribute. But I would definitely encourage your your to sit down and speak with your doctor about understanding why they think this happened and what else can be tested. Um, you know, moving forward since you've you know unfortunately had you know, negative outcomes thus far. Definitely. Um, and we are, we hate when they're unsuccessful, hate unsuccessful transfers. I just wish that it never yeah. would happen to anybody. I agree. Um, so there, uh, and apparently, um, I think we've gotten to most of our questions, but there is a question about baby aspirin. I saw it just pop up also. Um, is it okay to take baby aspirin during the time of FET and when do you take it? So definitely. Um, what would good lining measurements for embryo transfer? So baby aspirin can definitely be taken, um, you know, 
when you when you start your birth control in preparation for your frozen embryo transfer, um, there's really not necessarily a time frame that that can happen. You just just definitely want it on board. I would say at least a week or two prior to to embryo transfer. I usually start it well before then. Um, uh, so that's a good thing. And then what is a good? I, I just saw what is a good uh, uterine lining. Um, uh, for for measurement so the ideal would be eight millimeters and then it's also important that the the lining of the uterus be what what we call trilaminar which has a very specific sort of architecture um that indicates that it, the lining is receptive to um uh to the embryo but there are you know some individuals um that can't a achieve the eight millimeters and so greater than seven is is sometimes used as well um so it just really depends on your case but anywhere between seven eight millimeters is really ideal very good awesome well um oh we have one more question that someone just ooh. popped in the last minute um, cervical ectopic ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, I'm so sorry that 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 happened. Any way to prevent another cervical ectopic following FET. That is a very, very tough one. Um, those are those are super tricky. Um, unfortunately, when you have had an ectopic pregnancy of any kind, whether it's cervical or, or anything like that, um, it increases your risk of it happening again. Um, there are some individuals that may be candidates for a surgical procedure to help um, to uh, help decrease um, it, sometimes patients that have a history of a c-section or or any sort of manipulation to the cervix may be at increased risk for those kind of ectopic pregnancies and uh, truthfully in, in my experience a very small number of individuals are um, are candidates for a surgical procedure to help correct any of those defects that predispose you to the ectopic pregnancies. Um, but just time and trying again is your, your best option in that, in that, in that scenario. And I'm so sorry that you had a cervical ectopic. That's tricky. It was very, oh goodness. Yeah. I mean, and you know, there there are um, there are a few studies that actually show when you had acupuncture during a transfer, it reduced yes. the amount of atopics. So that might also be, I mean, if that's where, where, if the clinic you're going to allows you to have acupuncture during the transfer, that also might be a consideration as well, like a pre and post uh, acupuncture treatment during that time. Because the, the second treatment actually helps with relaxing uterine contractions. So if there is maybe, you know, possibility of doing that. I, I think that, what do you think about that idea? A hundred percent, not even a hundred percent, a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go, you Keeping know, everything you, calm down there. <laughs> absolutely. Calm so. is always better when we're, when we're talking about embryo transfer and we're talking about risk for ectopic and all of that kind of stuff for sure. So, so we wish you the best of luck and absolutely. Um, that. And, and um, we are out of time guys. So I want to thank Dr. Bauer for taking time out of her day to, to answer these questions. I My think, pleasure. Um, that, Sorry, uh, I'm technically challenged with the Instagram. No, I, always, I always have been, at least I'm consistent. <laughs> that's all right. It's, it's, you're here, right? That's awesome. <laughs> no. and, uh, and there's days where I have no idea what they've done to Instagram. I can't find anything. I'm like, the right? buttons have all moved. What's going I know. on? Here? No, that's not fair. They can't do that to the to us old people. <laughs> not do it. Yeah, I know. I have to get my son to help me. Like, what happened? Um, so, thank you guys so much. And if we didn't get to your question, uh, please um, let us know. Next week, we're going to have Dr. Wood on next uh, Wednesday, and then um, we'll also have tomorrow night. Um, I'm going to be doing not really a Q and A so much, but we're going to actually be speaking with a therapist um, on our Instagram about ways to cope with anxiety. So, you guys are welcome to join us, April. Brown is her name. Uh, so she's at Postpartum Therapist on Instagram. And um, we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, so everybody have a great night. And um, if you'd like to share this, we'd really appreciate it. We'd also like you guys to follow us. Uh, Dr. Bauer is at Jessica I'm Bauer. Jessica Indeed. Bauer underscore fertility doc. Fertility. Yeah. Follow Dr. Bauer, please. And then we're at FL Complete Wellness. Uh, so thank you guys so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>